Hi, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 101, Lecture 19. In this lecture, we want to solve several practice problems to better understand how Newton's laws of motion can be used in practical situations. This topic is covered in Chapter 5, our textbook by Surway and Jouette. Here is our first example involving Newton's laws of motion. The Earth's mass is approximately 6 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. Consider an apple with a mass of 0.5 kilograms. Calculate the gravitational force of Earth on apple. So we have a very massive object like the Earth, and then we have a, an apple that is not very massive. Actually, 0.5 kilograms is quite large for an apple, uh, but compared to the mass of planet Earth, this is not very much mass. Part A of this question is asking us to simply calculate the gravitational force of Earth on apple. We recognize this as the weight of the apple. We are going to assume that the apple is near the Earth's surface, and we know exactly how to calculate the weight of an apple. We have a formula for that. We know that the weight of any object is equal to the mass of the object times gravitational acceleration, which on Earth is 9.8 meters per second. So we can easily calculate the force of Earth on apple by taking the mass of the apple, that's m sub a, and multiplying it by g. Notice that in this example, I have very carefully labeled every, everything so that we can clearly distinguish between the Earth and the apple. These are the two objects that are involved in this particular problem. g, once again, for planet Earth is 9.8. And in our example, mass of the apple is 0 0.5 kilograms, giving us a weight of 4.9 newtons. This is the force of Earth on apple. And as I've indicated in the picture here, that force points downwards. In other words, the Earth in this example is pulling the apple straight downwards. We could describe that as being in the negative y direction. Part B says calculate the force of apple on Earth. Now, at first, this might seem like a strange question because we have never really encountered um, an equation or description of the force of apples on other objects. However, we know from Newton's third law of motion that for every action, there's an equal but opposite reaction. So if the Earth is pulling on the apple, then the apple must be pulling on Earth with exactly the same force, but in the opposite direction. So although we don't have any equations for apple forces, we can simply say that the force of apple on Earth has the same magnitude as the force of Earth on apple. And that magnitude has already been calculated as 4.9 newtons. So by the third law of motion, we're saying that the apple is pulling on Earth with 4.9 newtons, and it's pulling in the opposite direction. So we draw the arrow here pointing upwards or in the positive y direction. Now, this might seem strange that the apple is actually pulling on the Earth with exactly the same force, or at least the same magnitude that the Earth pulls on the apple, you might be wondering, why is it that I have seen apples fall to the ground, but I've never seen the Earth or the ground fall upwards towards the apple? To answer that question, calculate the acceleration of the apple and the Earth. So there's a force on the apple, which causes it to accelerate, there's also a force on the Earth, which will cause it to accelerate. We know how to calculate acceleration. That's Newton's second law of motion. According to Newton's second law of motion, the acceleration is equal to the force divided by the mass. To begin with, I want to calculate the acceleration of the apple. For that, I need the net force acting on the apple, and I need to divide that by the mass of the apple. Here we're going to ignore air resistance and assume that gravity is the only force. In that case, the net force on the apple will be 4.9 newtons. When you divide it by the mass of the apple, you find the acceleration of the apple to be 9.8 meters per second squared, which hopefully isn't too surprising. This is exactly what Galileo was trying to tell us. Objects near the surface of planet Earth fall with an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared. 
Next, let's, cal cal uh, let's calculate the acceleration of planet Earth. Acceleration of Earth is the force on Earth, or the net force on Earth, divided by the mass of Earth. Okay. Once again, don't confuse the two masses or the two accelerations. Here I'm trying to label everything very carefully as Apple and Earth. Well, the net force on Earth, we know what that is. Um, that's 4.9 newtons. And mass of the Earth is also given, given to us as this enormous number. And when we take 4.9 and we divide it by 6 times 10 to the 24, we find this astonishingly small number. So although the same magnitude of force acts on the two objects, the two objects have very different accelerations because they have different masses. Remember, mass is a resistance to acceleration. A very massive object like planet Earth tends to resist acceleration. It simply will not accelerate very much under a force of 4.9 newtons. Whereas a pretty light object like an apple will quickly accelerate under the force of 4.9 newtons. So the reason you have never seen planet Earth or the ground fall upwards towards the apple is because its acceleration would be imperceptibly small. Here's another problem involving Newton's laws of motion. A hockey puck is given an initial speed of 20 meters per second. It slides a distance of 115 meters before coming to rest. Find the coefficient of friction for puck on ice. If you're given a problem like this on an exam or on a homework assignment, it's always very helpful to draw a picture representing the situation. It's very important for you to be able to visualize the situation and in particular visualize the forces that are in play in a situation like this. For this problem, you might want to draw a picture like this. We have the hockey puck. We're assuming that this hockey puck is on planet Earth, so there must be some gravity there. We represent weight using this arrow. Weight is pulling the hockey puck down. We know how to calculate the magnitude of weight. It's just mg. Um, the hockey puck is in contact with the ice, so we expect contact forces. In particular, there is a normal force. Remember, the normal force is always perpendicular to the surface. And in this case, it's reacting to other perpendicular forces, so it's reacting to weight. In addition to the normal force, there's also friction. The hockey puck is moving, so the friction we're talking about is kinetic friction. In this picture, I'm assuming that the hockey puck is moving to the right. Remember that kinetic friction always points opposite the velocity vector. So if the puck is moving to the right, kinetic friction will point to the left. By the way, we know there is friction because the hockey puck starts with an initial speed of 20 meters per second and it slows down, eventually coming to rest. That tells us that there must be something slowing it down. In this case, it's the force of friction that's slowing it down. We want to calculate the coefficient of friction based on the information given here. Now, you're going to have to think carefully about what coefficient of friction has to do with speed and distance. It helps to maybe reverse engineer the answer here. Remember from kinematics and the problems you solved um, in chapters two and four that the initial speed, the final speed, the distance, and acceleration are all related through the kinematic equations. So given the uh, speed information, I should be able to calculate the acceleration of the puck. Now, acceleration of the puck, of course, is related to the net force on the puck uh, through Newton's second law of motion. So if I have the acceleration, I can calculate the net force. And of course, the net force is the sum of all the forces. So at least indirectly, it's related to the force of friction. If I can figure out the net force, then I can figure out the force of friction. And of course, if I can figure out the force of friction, then I should be able to figure out the coefficient of friction for puck on ice. So this is definitely a multi-step problem that you must go through. We'll start with the kinematic equations. You'll have to go through your list of kinematic equations. You'll quickly realize that maybe the equation that's best suited to this problem is this one. This is a nice equation because we have everything in this equation except the acceleration. So we can say that the initial position of the hockey puck is zero. It will slide 115 meters. We'll call that its final position. 
the initial speed of the hockey puck is given to us as 20. Don't forget to square it. And the hockey puck eventually comes to rest. That tells us that the final speed must be zero. Square. The only thing missing from this equation is the acceleration. We can now do a little bit of algebra and solve for the acceleration. And we find that the acceleration of the puck is approximately minus 1.7 meters per second squared. Now to make further progress, we need to analyze the forces a little more carefully. The normal force and weight are relatively easy. We know that the magnitude of weight is mg. We know that it operates in the y direction, in the negative y direction. So we can write the weight vector as 0, comma, minus mg. That represents this arrow here. As you can see, the arrow points in the negative y direction, hence minus mg. The normal force um, operates in the y direction, in the positive y direction, as you can see from the picture. It's perpendicular to the ice surface, and it reacts to weight so its magnitude must be mg. Remember that for the normal force, we deduce its magnitude um, by looking at other perpendicular forces. So the normal force will have components 0, comma, mg. The force of friction is a little bit trickier to calculate. Remember that the uh, magnitude of kinetic friction is simply equal to the magnitude of the normal force times the coefficient of kinetic friction. Its direction is opposite the velocity. As you can see from the picture, its direction is going to be in the negative x direction. So we can write the friction vector as minus mu n comma 0. So friction has no component in the y direction. It does have a component in the x direction, in the negative x direction in particular. Now we know what the magnitude of the normal vector is. It's mg. So we can substitute that in here and we find that the uh, friction vector is minus mu mg comma zero. Now we're not really interested in individual forces. What we're interested in, at least for the purpose of Newton's second law of motion, is the net force. That's the quantity that appears in Newton's second law. So we must add these forces together. Remember that when you're adding vectors, you add the x components, and then separately you add the y component. So I'm going to add the x component of this force, and the x component of this force, and the x component of this force. That tells me that the x component of the net force is minus mu mg. And then I'm going to similarly add the y component. So I'll add minus mg to plus mg to zero, and of course all of that adds up to zero. So now my net force is minus mu mg comma zero. As you can see, not much is happening in the y direction. All of the interesting stuff is going on in the x direction. Remember, ultimately, what we're after is this quantity here, mu sub k. Now that I have the net force, I'm ready to use Newton's second law of motion. Remember, the second law of motion tells you that the acceleration is equal to the net force divided by mass. That's the same thing as taking the net force and multiplying it by 1 over mass. The net force is this vector here. We're going to multiply it by 1 over m. Remember, when you're multiplying a scalar by a vector, you're going to um, distribute the scalar into the vector. So you're going to multiply the x component, and then you're going to multiply the y component. Multiplying the y component, of course, just gives you 0. Multiplying the x component essentially crosses out the m, so the masses cancel basically from this, uh, from this equation, and we find that the acceleration is minus mu g comma zero. This tells us that the acceleration of the puck is minus mu g in the x direction, and its acceleration in the y direction is zero. That should make sense. All of the motion of this puck is basically restric restricted to the horizontal surface of the ice, um, the, the hockey puck is not flying upwards or anything like that. So now I can tell you definitively that the acceleration in the x direction is minus mu g. So now I'm focusing on the x component. And I now recall that I've already calculated the acceleration. 
earlier using kinematic equations, we found that the acceleration is minus 1.739. And now using Newton's second law of motion, I have found that the acceleration is minus mu g. I can now set these two equal to each other. We know g is 9.8 and solve for mu. And when we do that, we find that the coefficient of kinetic friction for puck on ice is approximately 0 0.177. Here's another practice problem involving Newton's laws of motion. A block with mass of three kilograms is initially held at rest on an incline as shown. The incline forms an angle of 30 degrees with respect to the horizontal. The coefficients of friction are 0.2 and 0.1 for static friction and kinetic friction respectively. At t equals zero, the block is released. Does it slide down or remain at rest? So the question is a very simple one. We just want to know whether this block is going to stay put in place or as a result of gravity pulling it down, if it's going to slide down the incline. In some sense, I'm basically asking you whether the friction on this inclined surface is enough to keep the block at rest or if gravity is going to win out and pull the block down. To answer that question, we have to carefully analyze all the forces acting on the block. To begin with, we're going to adopt a rotated coordinate system. We're going to adapt our coordinate system to the situation at hand. What that means is that our X coordinate is going to be chosen parallel to the surface and our Y coordinate or Y axis is going to be chosen perpendicular to the surface on which the block is sliding. The dash line indicates the horizontal direction. Um, I notice that this dash line and the base of the inclined plane form um, parallel lines. The surface of the incline is a transversal and therefore this angle must be theta. In other words, this theta and this theta are alternate interior angles of a transversal, so they must be equal to each other. I'm going to need this angle a little bit later um, the angle theta is given to me in the problem as 30 degrees. Now that I have a handle on the geometry of the problem, I want to analyze the forces. I know that weight is pulling the block straight down in the negative y direction. I also know that there must be a normal force. Nor notice that the normal force does not point straight up. The normal force is always perpendicular to the contact surface. So as you might guess, in this case, the normal force is not simply uh, equal in magnitude to weight. The normal force and weight are not pointing in the same direction. In addition to weight and the normal force, there is also friction. And friction is going to be uh, pointing up the incline. We know this because we know that gravity is going to be pulling the block downwards. We don't yet know if the block is going to move or not but there will be a force pulling it downwards and friction will react to that force. So friction will be parallel to the surface and pointing upwards. Now we need to calculate each one of these forces more precisely. We need to know their X and Y components. Notice how the normal uh, force is pointing in the positive Y direction. It does not have an X component. Notice how friction is pointing in the negative x direction. It does not have a y component. But weight, unlike most of our problems so far, is pointing both in the x direction and the y direction. In other words, because of the rotated coordinate system that we have adopted, weight is no longer just a simple vector pointing in the negative y direction. The magnitude of weight is easy to figure out. Its magnitude is always mg. The mass of the block is given to us as 3. g is 9.8. So we know that weight has a magnitude of 29.4. So the length of this arrow is 29.4. But we now need to calculate its x component and its y component. Remember the usual procedure for calculating the x and y components of a vector. You start at the tip of the vector. You draw a line connecting it to the x-axis. This line needs to form a 90-degree angle. We now have a triangle that we can look at. The triangle is formed by these three points here. 
And if we can only calculate one of the angles of this triangle, then we can use trigonometry to find out what the angles are. If this is 30 degrees here, then this angle here should be 60 degrees. I'll let you think about that for a few seconds. You should be able to convince yourself that this angle must be 60 degrees. And if the angle here is 60 degrees, then we can calculate the x component and the y component of this vector using cosines and sines. More specifically, the x component of weight is going to be the magnitude times cosine of 60, which gives us 14.7, and the y component is going to be mg times sine of 60, although we should put a minus sign in front of it because we know that weight is pointing in the negative y direction. Remember in our picture, the positive y direction is pointing upwards along the normal vector. Now that we have the x and y components of weight, we can figure out the other forces. We know that the normal force reacts to other perpendicular forces. In other words, the normal force reacts to other forces in the y direction. The normal force does not react to 14.7, it reacts to 25.461. In other words, the normal force reacts only to that portion or that component of weight that is actually in the y direction. This tells us that the normal force must have a magnitude of 25.46. While weight points in the negative direction, uh, normal force points in the opposite direction, in the positive y direction. Now that we have the magnitude of the normal force, we can talk about friction. We don't yet know if this is static friction or kinetic friction because we don't know if this thing is going to slide. However, we do remember that static friction does have a maximum value. That maximum value is mu s times n. Mu s is given to us as 0.2, and n is given to us as 25.46. We just figured that out. So we find that the maximum value of static friction is 5.1. We're now in a position to answer the question whether the block slides down or not. Notice that a portion of weight is in the y direction. That's this minus 25. That's being balanced or canceled by the normal force, by this 25.46 newtons here. And then a portion of weight is in the x direction. This is the portion of weight, the component of weight, that is responsible for pulling the block down. If the block does end up moving, it will move in the x direction in response to 14.7 newtons of gravity. Can static friction overcome this force? Well, unfortunately, no. Static friction has a maximum value of 5.1, so we can now say since Wx, the x component of weight, is greater than the maximum value, the block will definitely slide down the incline. Here's one last practice problem involving Newton's laws of motion. A sprinter initially at rest begins to run forward. His mass is 75 kilograms. The coefficient of static friction for his shoes on ground is 1.2. Assuming maximum acceleration, in what time can the sprinter run a distance of 100 meters? Now, to answer this question, you have to understand something about the dynamics of running or walking. As a person walks forward, his feet push backwards on the ground. A little more precisely, in this picture, I'm imagining a person walking to the right, and as he walks to the right, his hind leg, his back foot, is pushing backwards on the ground. More precisely, the muscles in the foot are pushing downwards and to the left. So there's a net force of the foot on the floor that is represented by this red diagonal arrow. And you can see that red diagonal arrow has a vertical component and a horizontal component. There's also a reaction force. If the foot is pushing on the floor, then the floor is going to push back on the foot. So there is the force of floor on foot that is acting on the person's foot. And in fact, it's this force that's responsible for the person's motion. These two forces, the blue arrow and the red arrow, being an action-reaction pair, have equal magnitudes but opposite directions, according to Newton's third law of motion. 
As you can see, the force of floor on foot has a horizontal component and a vertical component. If the person were jumping up and down, we would be interested in the vertical component. It would be the vertical component that's responsible for propelling the person upwards. In this example, the person is simply running to the right. So we're interested in the horizontal component of that force. Now this force is essentially a contact force. It's the result of contact between the person's foot or his shoes and the floor. And you should remember that the perpendicular component of the contact force is the normal force, while the parallel component is friction. So it is in fact the force of friction that is responsible for propelling the person forward. That should make sense if you've ever tried walking on ice you know that it's almost impossible to walk or run on ice in the total absence of friction. Friction is absolutely necessary for walking or running. The type of friction we're talking about is static friction, not kinetic friction. Although the person himself, his upper body is moving, the foot that is planted backwards at the moment that it is pushing on the ground is at rest relative to the ground, so the relative type of friction is static friction. If the person wants to run this distance in the minimum amount of time, he needs to have maximum acceleration. To achieve maximum acceleration, we require maximum friction. We know how to calculate the maximum value of static friction. That's simply mu n. Remember that n is a reactive force. In this case, on a horizontal surface, n is reacting to weight. Weight is simply mg. So we have g here, we have m here, and the coefficient of static friction is 1.2. Multiplying all that out, we find that the maximum available force of friction is 882 newtons. Of course, this is not necessarily the force that the floor exerts on the foot. The person has to be strong enough or muscular enough to exert a force of 882 newtons on the floor so that the floor can then react with this maximum value of friction. Assuming that our sprinter is extremely powerful and strong, we're going to um, conclude that he is capable of exerting this force on the ground and therefore the ground will push back on him with a horizontal force of 882 newtons. Now what we're really interested in is the acceleration of the sprinter. We can find his acceleration using Newton's second law of motion. According to the second law, acceleration is equal to the net force divided by mass. In this particular problem, the only uh, force acting in the horizontal direction is the force of friction. There is weight and there's a normal force, but those are balancing each other out. They add up to zero. So the only relevant force is this force of friction which we will take and divide it by the mass of the sprinter, and we find that his acceleration is 11.76 meters per second squared. Now that we have his acceleration, we can calculate the time that it takes to run this distance. We can do that using the kinematics equations. So at this point, you should go through your list of the kinematic equations, figure out which one is relevant, and after a little bit of thinking, you should be able to figure out that the time required to run a distance of 100 meters is given by this formula from the kinematic equations. Plugging in numbers, we find that this person uh, can run the 100 meter dash in 4.124 seconds. Now, to be honest uh, with you, this time is considerably faster than the fastest time that anyone has ever run the 100 meter dash. The current world record for the 100 meter dash was set by the Jamaican runner Usain Bolt in 2009, and he ran the 100 meter dash at 9.58 seconds. That tells you that it's incredibly, incredibly difficult to maintain this acceleration for the entire 100 meters. So what we have here is a lower bound on how fast the 100 meter dash could possibly be run. As you can see, there's a lot of room for improvement, but ultimately the laws of physics dictate that no human being, given this coefficient of static friction, can run the 100 meter dash faster than about four seconds.
And that's the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.